Three. Welcome to the Pickle Barrel Fantasy Football Podcast, July 5th, 2016, Season 2, Episode 2. I'm Andy. I'm Frank. Johnny Motts. And Tony V. Welcome, welcome, folks. America just turned 240 years old. Katy Perry becomes the first Twitter handle to break 90 million views. Hillary Clinton just got indicted, or excuse me, not indicted for breaking the law. And Johnny Motch just discovered Tinder. Tinder, Tinder, Tinder. Johnny Motch, how old are you? I am uh, 30 years young. 30 years young. And so how old are these Tinder videos that you've been searching for? Well, you know, I have a liberal age range because I've found that doesn't really dictate, you know, who you are as a person. So anyway, AJ ain't nothing but a number. 18 to 30. I found I wasn't swiping right on anything over 30, so I just alerted it there. <laughs> but I mean, you know, average, say 22, 23, I am from Athens, Georgia. It's a college town, so if I didn't mess with those biddies, someone else would. Yes. <laughs> well, congratulations, John. I'm glad you found success with 20 year old ladies. Too young to have a beer, but plenty old for Johnny Motts to have sex with. <laughs> that is, uh, make love to. <laughs> that's that's an entire decade difference, and at uh, at this age, it's it's not entirely unrespectable. Not well at done. All. Well done. Well, thank you. Moving on. <laughs> well, AJ. Okay. Well, first of all, let's let's go ahead and tell you guys why there's some two completely new random dudes here on the podcast today, as opposed to having Stephen last week. It's just because this is our league's podcast. We share this with our entire league of record, which is the illustrious and glorious LIG, the league. And uh, today we have two of our favorite league members, my brother, Tony B, and my good friend, Johnny Motts, and of course... Frank. And of course, Frank. (laughs) So it'll mostly be me and Frank with some sort of guest from the league, and it will usually be one of the three people we've had, Steve-O, AJ, uh, Johnny Motts, or Jeef. Eve. And usually Jeff is sitting in the background jacking off to pictures of Jordy Nelson catching touchdown passes from Aaron Rodgers. Utterly speechless. I listened to the last podcast. I believe he literally said, Hi, I'm Jeff. Was... That was it. That was it. That he was should it. not have been there. <laughs> Jeff's going to kill us, except not only does he participate when he's on the podcast, he doesn't listen to it either. So, so he, will, he will never know this conversation. <laughs> well, let's go ahead, AJ. Why don't you bring us into the fantasy news? What's your first big news item in the fantasy wasteland of late June, early July? Oh, Andy, thanks for, uh, thanks for the wonderful intro. This is uh, Tony B, or uh, AJ, as you'll sometimes hear me uh, called commonly... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in this particular case, we've got uh, a little bit of fantasy news for you. Uh, top of July 5th. There's not much going on right now this time of year, but it's sort of after uh, the, the Independence Day is your uh, start of the fantasy season. So there's not much that we've got going on. Although Le'Veon Bell, if you have not heard in his most recent news, is apparently a rapper as well and believes his contract should be put out there for everyone to hear. So, uh, in his quote, I'm at the top, and they know this. I'm going to make 15 a year. And they know this. Very... <laughs> uh, I mean, incredible lyrics there, first off. Did he just rhyme, know this with know this? Yeah, uh, if, if I read my... pit bull there. <laughs> Very mystical. <laughs> correctly, that is, is where he's at. Now, don't keep in mind that... Uh, Always healthy, always reliable. With the one near injury, knee injury that he came back from, Adrian Peterson only makes fourteen million dollars a year, and uh, Shady McCoy is a, a Peasley eight million dollars a year, and the NFL salary cap is one fifty five. So, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, Le'Veon Bell believes he's worth ten percent of a team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, there's an argument to be made for that, is there not? Like. I mean, he is one of the best, but that there are twenty-two. Like said, so, so he's going to get paid his fifteen mil a year, even if he gets hurt, which he does frequently, or piss hot for marijuana, which he does frequently <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> I, I, I'll sit, you, I'll sit here from the sideline as a Le'Veon Bell owner from last year, and I'll simply tell you that my number one pick had a number one knee injury, <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed him for this three or four games that he was actually healthy. But on to more news. And I'm really reaching here because I have two stories that I'd love to talk about. One would be Drew Stanton, the backup to Carson Palmer, saying he is the team's backup. 
Huge fantasy news. Yeah. Huge. Uh, <laughs> keep in mind, he is 32 years old. Uh, believes he will start when Palmer, who is 37, retires, but uh, that's irrelevant. And then we've got a painkiller restory, and this was three sites, um, that tells me that uh, apparently NFL players have been pushed painkillers. That's not news. So the one thing that is news that I'll talk about is that Randall Cunningham, Another black quarterback from the Eagles. Prior to our boy, Campbell Soup. Donovan McNabb? Donovan McNabb. I love old Donovan McNabb. Well, apparently he's got some quality seed because his daughter, <laughs> Vashti. Watch out, girls. John Monarella is on the prowl. <laughs> Vashti. Vashti Cunningham qualified for the Olympics in Rio with a six foot, five and a half inch high jump. Oh, I thought you were going to say something different there, but at least in today's world of transgenders. But <laughs> I think she's all female here. I don't think we're all there. Poor the rest in peace to that poor young woman <laughs> traveling to the depths of hell in uh, so South basically, America. So basically, if I get this correct, AJ, there is zero fantasy football news to be had. On July 5th is a $15 million desired contract and an 18-year-old who qualified for Rio. Hopefully she does not drink the water. Or get bit by a mosquito. Yeah. All right. Well, that being said, let's go ahead and get into our podcast today. Today's podcast, we were initially going to do a tight end, top tens, but we were like, that's pretty boring. So what we wanted to do for you guys was give you guys a, a, a quick snapshot of the different draft strategies that are out there. So what we did is we did a mock draft, and each one of us did a certain strategy um, where we stuck to that strategy um, and drafted our team. So we're going to start out with Frank and his wide receiver heavy strategy. All right. Um, yeah, so Frank, take it away, and what we're going to do is go through each team as opposed to going each round. Yeah. So Frank, tell us about your, your team, why you drafted it, and going out to, to eight, nine rounds, tell us about your team. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I'll run through them real quick, but first off, I'd like to say, and I, and I did I did talk about this on the previous episode, I've been burned this last year real hard by RB, so I'm, I'm really all in on this strategy, so I think people are going to really like it. Well, we'll see if you think I can actually get these players. But the first guy I got, and keep in mind I'm picking from the seventh spot, um, I got old uh, Julio Jones. I don't think I'm going to get him at the seventh spot. I, I think that's a little ridiculous. There were some things that happened early on in the draft. Right, but, um, not going early, a few other yeah. little things. It, I have to imagine that Julio Jones goes before the five. Or the fifth pick, or, or at the fifth pick, somewhere around there. So more reasonably, players I might be looking at, and these were some of the guys that were on the board, would be uh, a Nug, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, Nuke, or whatever the fuck they call him, Des Bryant, or AJ Green. Those are probably the guys when I when we started this draft that I was looking at first off. Thankfully, I ended up Julio. <coughs> that's great. Second round came around, got AJ Green. Once again, I don't think this guy's going to fall to you in the second round, but if he does, fucking take him. Yeah, don't, absolutely. don't even think I mean, about it. That, the 12th, 13th pick? That would be the 13th. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 14th. 14th, 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 14th pick. And yeah. Jesus, I think the more likely scenario there is like a Jordy Nelson or, or a Des Bryant. Yeah. And but, but still, suppose you get AJ Green and Des Bryant. This strategy still works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the glorious thing about the wide receivers. I mean, right off the top, you are sitting at. Two number one running or wide receivers with quality quarterbacks seasoned in the league throwing to them. Oh yeah, you can't be upset about those two picks. Pretty Not much a all. lock for plus thirteen, fourteen hundred yards, double digit touchdowns. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, and so and and once again, the other guys I was looking at, if AJ wasn't there or because I didn't think he would be there, I was looking at either now Sean Jeffries and Amari Cooper or Jordy Nelson, one all of those solid. guys. All saw guys, yeah. But AJ Green, I would still take above all all three of those guys. So, you know, I had to do what I had to do. Uh, Third round, um, this was a little bit tougher. Um, I ended up going with T.Y. Hilton. I think this guy's going (laughs) to rebound a lot. I know he's not a huge touchdown guy, but he has a breakaway speed. He gets a lot of targets from Luck, and he's got he's got Andrew Luck throwing to him. But um, you know, I I think T.Y. in the third is justifiable. And you had an option, I think, when we did the mock draft choose between Demarius Thomas and T.Y. Hill. I did, yeah. But the, you went with a better quarterback, which is not, you know, maybe Demarius Thomas is the better talent. But at the end of the day, he's got butt fumble thrown to him. He does. So that's an understandable choice in my mind. Or you have Andrew Luck. Yeah. Right. Give me Andrew Luck any day of the week. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and a couple other guys, Cooks and Edelman, they're both great receivers. It's hard to it's hard to really, really decide between all of them. They're all real close to each other in, in that range. But I took Andrew Luck just because – 
he's a great quarterback, and, and I think there's just going to be more production there, more opportunities for fantasy points. Fourth round, this is a guy that that is really interesting. I don't know why he goes so low exactly, um, but I took Randall Cobb for the fourth spot. Remember, I'm going wide receiver heavy, so this was my <coughs> – my last guy to really round it off, make sure I was real stout. And I did consider a running back here, and I would if I were you. If you're going with the uh, all-wide receiver strategy, it's really more for the f- first few rounds, maybe for six rounds. But I was considering a LaShawn McCoy or a, a, to- or a Thomas Rawls here at this spot too. But um, went with Randall Cobb to keep the wide receiver tradition, and uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with I that don't too. Th- I don't think in most traditional leagues you can go wrong with this, knowing you have a flex. I mean, if this is going to be your strategy where you take all wide receivers, having Ryan, Randall Cobb as your flex... I know, right? Solid. Oh, yeah. And I, and I guess, too, is like it depends on how your league is, is structured, because in our league we have three wide receiver positions and a flex. So mm-hmm. that gives you often to playing four wide receivers. If you've got that, then this strategy makes more sense than almost anything else because you have so many wide receivers you can possibly play. And if you're playing in a PPR, get the hell out of town. I mean, who doesn't want those first four names? Julio, Green, Hilton, and Cobb. They're all getting high-volume targets from quality quarterbacks. I'd say the quarterback picks, at least from you, Frank, here, were very wise. You you didn't pick a single wide receiver so far who's getting a subpar quarterback they're all franchise guys they are and that, that's that's the glorious thing about picking them in the early rounds and the, i mean and that's why i think wide receiver heavy helps out with our league a lot more than maybe some other leagues in the way they're structured because we do have four spots i mean you can enforce you got 10 spots total four of those you can play wide receivers so loading up on them theoretically it just makes the most sense it helps you out makes you the most diverse and i don't want to jump the gun but just i'm looking back at the draft and one thing to, to tamper down here take away uh, that last pick and Plug in one of these guys in round eight, Emmanuel Sanders or John Brown. That does bring up an interesting point. So there there's, is that. Where, there's where you're losing out on the heavy wide receiver strategy, right? Is that there are these great wide receiver, maybe lotto ticket types that you kind of like John Brown, Emmanuel Sanders. Maybe they turn out to be uh, a, a great pick later. But at the same time, I mean, your strategy is incredibly defensible when you're getting Randall Cobb in the fourth. Exactly, yeah. And then there's also the whole aspect of you can trade these guys away during the season if you need to. So you got trade bait. But, I mean, I'm, I, I just, it's so safe now with, with the wide receivers, and I feel incredibly comfortable with those first four guys. So I'll kind of run through my last four real quick. Um, made, a few running, made a few other position picks as well besides wide receiver. But I went with uh, Deion Lewis at the number five spot. The guy was awesome last year before he got before he got hurt. A PPR machine. I think he averaged six catches a game as a running back. Plus, he got to run the ball. He was on the field more than Blunt. He basically just missed out on the the uh, red zone uh, rushes and whatnot. But he got hurt, and, and but you're right. I mean, he was line. he was pretty tasty, especially in a half PPR, full oh, PPR yeah. co- format with yeah. Tom Brady. You know, using him as the as the the outlet or the the you know safety valve. Exactly. And Brady's done that a lot more as he's gotten older. Uh, number six, I took Jordan Matthews, a third-year receiver. He's gotten steadily better each year. was a little bit disappointing based off how he got drafted last year, but, I mean, he's still the number one guy in town. I don't see how he doesn't get better besides maybe that just offense just sucks more. But whatever, I think he should still get the points. Sixth round, I'll take him. Seventh, took Frank Gore, old dude. Still just playing, playing with Andrew Luck, doesn't get hurt. I mean, he should get some goal line touches, should get should yeah. get some points. My big fear with him is just his age. Yeah, and I understand that. I mean, at what point, is he 33 now? No, I think he's thir- he's about to be 32. Okay, yeah. I mean, but, you know, I mean, it, there's something to be said for those guys that are playing that late, like Steve Smith types, that seem to just be chugging along. They've got I mean, some freak durability. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. So, we'll see. He doesn't have very many years left, but seventh round, I'll take a flyer on him. I mean, it's not that big. He's a starter. I'll, I'll do it. And then with my eighth pick, I took uh, old Tony Ramo. Tony Ramo. <laughs> the resurgence of Tony Ramo. Well, we'll see. I, I'm a Cowboys fan, so I'm, I'm hoping. But uh, I mean, I would I would think that you would supplement that with another uh, sleeper quarterback. I would in the, later round. in the later rounds, absolutely. So he's just my first guy. But um, those are the first eight for me. Um, went very heavy. I ended up taking five receivers, two running backs, and a quarterback. So that's my heavy wide receiver strategy for your first eight rounds. And you know, what I think I think at the end of the day, when I looked at all the teams, I thought that Frank's team was the strongest. 
So I don't know what you guys felt. Maybe you guys are biased because you're, you picked your teams. But <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I did. I, I looked at it and just like I, I've done that a few times in some mock drafts and been very happy with like the insane wide receiver core that I end up getting. When you pick them early, it just looks so beautiful. It but. does. It does, comparatively speaking. And, and we've talked about this and why wide receivers heavy, why wide receivers first. Because the other guys you take, there's too many question marks. With running backs, there's the injury concerns. With quarterbacks, if they bust, you're fucked. I mean, wide receivers are about the safest thing you can go with, and they still provide that upside, which is why you've seen this macro shift over the last year, really, that where, when it's become apparent. But really, over the last couple of years, where you've seen wide receivers take that prominence in the entire, the entire structure of who's going first. Absolutely. i got to say, though, uh, I, I'm... I, Johnny Motts here. It's my third year in the league. It's been my third season. And I have noticed in my time, the, the teams that do win, I guess this is inevitable because they fucking won, <laughs> have awesome running backs. Talk about your team my first year. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You had what, DeMarco Murray and... Uh, I had DeMarco Murray Lynch and Eddie Lacy. Yeah, seen, and that's why you won. <laughs> Fast forward to last year, I know it was a wide receiver team. But he also had David Johnson. D'Angelo Williams. And D'Angelo well, Williams. So and, he was also well-balanced. Well, that's what he did is he, he kind of like played his cards right, did the wide receiver first strategy before it was popular, and then ended up saving the money. And we're in a fab league, you know, free auction or free agent auction bid league. And he ended up saving his money, being able to pick up those awesome running backs late. Which is, you know, you could do, but here's the thing, is I feel like you could do that with any position. Suppose you went running back heavy and then chose to spend your money on wide receivers later. That could work too. Anyway. And, and no, no pun intended here, but John, excuse me, but our friend Ian Harris, who won our league last year, bumbled his way into David Johnson. <laughs> He did not pick him with the foresight of knowing he would have the season yet. You know, I'll maybe he did. Credit. Maybe he did. Uh, I don't think so. It's his keeper. <laughs> he drafted him, so I think he Let's remember something. that at a certain point, David, <laughs> he did Johnson, draft him. David Johnson was number three on the Arizona running back Cardinals death, death chart. Uh, oh, I absolutely agree. For three, four and, weeks. And maybe Ian read a blind shot article in the middle of a hippie trip yeah. <laughs> that told him to draft him last year, but we can all agree that he was not a commonly drafted player. No. And he got him cheap as shit, and that did not hurt his chances at winning our league championship. All right, next up we got Johnny Motts with the balance strategy. This is my personal favorite strategy where you just pick the best player that's on the board unless you have serious needs at a certain position. So, John, start us off. Why your first round? Why? Well, for, uh, preamble, I like to, I just, this isn't how I usually draft. It was fun. I like it. I look at my team as, you know, I got a quarterback in the fourth round. I never do that. Or third round, rather. So... New, uh, new experience. I like my team because it's funky. Um, yeah, I went with wide receiver first because DeAndre Hopkins was there in the ninth pick, and that just seemed like a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, oh, with the ninth, yes. Yeah. I mean, if you, you have if, to. I mean, I, unless I don't know who would be around with the ninth pick, who would you pick above DeAndre Hopkins at that point? You were kind of playing with AP, maybe, but yeah, but, uh, but I mean, you know, obviously the injury history. He's old. Yeah. DeAndre Hopkins is, is uh, you know on his way up. He's a young up and now up and coming. He is now that becomes problematic when you look at my second pick, which is Lamar Miller, which is it's great. I mean, I like the team, Lamar Miller and DeAndre Hopkins, except for they're all on the same team. You know, whatever. I they, guess if they end up sucking, you're really sucking. If they end up being really good, though. But individually, talking about Lamar Miller, I love him. Love him. I actually I drafted him last year, so I'm partial. Um, and uh, you know he did uh, okay with, with the Florida team, but moving over to Texas, I am very pleased to get him as my second round. I, I think, and this goes back to what John already said, which was running backs importance. While we're already starting to talk about it like it's less important, it's it's still very important. And even and here's what's great about running backs: if the team sucks. The running back still has a chance of having a great year, and he's gonna. If the team sucks, the running back should early still year, get the yeah. carries. He yeah. should still get the carries. You see, he's still seen at the goal line. You get a number one running back, uh, John. I mean, it's a balanced pick. You well, it, regardless of whether the team's good or bad, it's a balanced, solid pick. And something to keep in mind with our league in general, we we got a ten man league, so it's a you know relatively small league with. Uh, half point PPR, so guys like your Danny Woodheads and Deion Lewis are decent. So 
very easy to get a decent running back. That's why someone like Marv Miller can set you apart, which is what you got to do to win. But third round, Cam Newton. He goes on with what I was just saying. He's just next level. If he does anything like he did last year, not to mention just as someone who likes watching these games, I would love to own that player. You know, I think I, I fall into the same <laughs> kind of trap sometimes. I'm like, if there's one game I want to watch, it's my quarterback because he plays yeah. all the time. But, I mean, no, Cam Newton in the third round, you, you're right. If he does what he do, did last year, not only is he justified taking him in the third round, he'd probably be justified taking him early. The, the worry is that he's had those shitty seasons before. Yeah. Listen, visiting in from North Carolina, I can tell you the hype train for the Panthers is huge. <laughs> and getting Cam Newton in the third round is a safe pick. I'm just going to throw three numbers at you the, from last year's Cam. Actually, let me just tell you, I mean, he has not passed for less than 3,500 yards in, with the exception of one season since 2011. Last year he passed for 3,800. He rushed for... Ten touchdowns. He passed for an additional thirty-five, and he's getting Kelvin Benjamin back. I was gonna, yeah, Mister Kelvin. Benjamin. I mean, but with the Carolina Panthers, you know, if, if a Carolina Panthers fan wins the Super Bowl, what's the first thing he does? He turns off his PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I hear you there. I hear you there, uh, Andy, and and it's a legitimate point. But in this particular case, our our Super Bowl was played it, four it, games earlier, yeah. and I think it's a safe pick. I, I want to keep talking about um, Carolina, and luckily I can do that with my fourth pick because I got Kelvin Benjamin. Once again, I'm the third year guy picking. Uh, a little bit with the heart and Kelvin Benjamin I had in my first year. So I love him. He was fun to watch. Um, I think him and Cameron are going to be explosive. And what I want to say about Carolina as a team, uh, totally lost my thought. I smoke a lot of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the short-term memory is an issue. <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they, I mean, can you imagine that, that Carolina is going to be worse because it has Kelvin Benjamin back? That's the thing is like, or, or do you think is where you're going with that? Is that is there too many other players now that have been no. Cam Newton's favorite? No, I, I apologize. It came back to me. It's the defenses they're going to be playing against. What? Who are they playing against? Atlanta, oh, yeah. Atlanta, New Orleans, <laughs> New Orleans. Thank you. In Atlanta, I mean Atlanta, and Tampa Bay, and Tampa Bay. Basically, sure. I get what you're saying. They face six defenses, given that they play three of those teams twice, that are pretty shitty. Yes. So anyway, you, yeah, you, but you know what? Anxiety. You, you know what, John? Here though, I mean, I just I just sang Cam's praises, and I'm just gonna go back to the to the Panthers. And I'm a Falcons fan. I could give two shits about the Panthers, but living so close to, to town, you can't help but hear the hype train. And in this particular case, <laughs> Choo Choo is coming because it took a year off. It got healthy, and in 2014, his rookie season, the man. You're talking about Calvin Benjamin, right? Calvin Benjamin. Oh, yeah. The man got 1,008 yards and nine touchdowns as a rookie. Now, remember, so, I remember. So if beautiful. he even just tops that healthy. I mean, if you get a 1,200, 1,300 yards, 13 touchdown season, are you not happy in that pick in the fourth round? In the fourth, yeah, I'm happy. Absolutely I remember happy. watching them in 2014, and it looked like uh, two uh, high school kids playing with some middle schoolers tossing the ball over their heads. These are two it did. tall, athletic motherfuckers who just, just make it happen. Um, anyway, that being said, I, if you look, just stopping at my four picks, you got Hopkins and Benjamin as my wide receivers, Cam Newton and Lamar Miller, so it is that well-balanced. It feels good. Um, I'm going to skim through the, the rest and move on with the podcast. Got Michael Floyd, solid. I also ended him last year, partial, but phenomenal. I would argue he's going to be the number one. You think he'll be? Receiver. You think he'll outdo Larry Fitz and John Brown on that on that Arizona? Well, offense? I think not necessarily that I would put my money on it, but I will say that uh, he's the most reliable. I would say out of all those, if Fitz is getting older. Floyd is kind of your flyer. Um, I mean, I, I apologize, John I, Brown. I would just argue, John, that that is too early. Like all of these receivers from Car- from the Cardinals. Well, they had a great season last year. It, it, taking any one of those guys before the sixth is too early. Maybe even the seventh is too early because the way they're I, falling. Who's gonna? Who's it gonna be? Who right? else? Who else wants to take it? Well, no, I would say like who's it gonna be? Like you're right. All those all those wide receivers are very enticing, but there's three of them, and you know there's very few teams where you look and you see three playable pass catchers. It really is like I think it's been about four years. Since I mean, the maybe did it I mean maybe in 2014 yeah. you had Edelman, Gronk, and LaFell were all playable, but. 
I'm trying to think of another duo other than Floyd Fitz well, and John Brown and, from last and, year, and like, I, it's hard. It's not coming up real quickly. No, it's not. To that point, I just want to point out, you talking about the New, New England Patriots and the Green Bay Packers, two phenomenal teams, and that's what uh, th- yeah. this team represents. They've got uh, one of the best up-and-coming running backs. they got three amazing wide receivers. Uh, steady as hell. Uh, I, think he, I think having a piece of that team is never a bad investment. Yeah. I just think it's a little early. All right, moving on. Delaney Walker. I'll admit, six. once again, third year, I owned him two years ago. I, I like these names. I, I recognize. But I looked at his stats the last three years. He's been solid, about eight, 900 yards. Um, Good for about seven, eight touchdowns. Yeah, and he's got his uh, second year uh, quarterback coming in. It should only up things, and he had his best year of football. He's been in the league seven, eight years. He had his best year last year with the first year of this guy. And he's I, coming back. I will say this, and you probably didn't run across it, but there, there was an article I ran across about a month or two ago where it did say Delaney Walker would prefer if he was uh, not catching the ball as much as next year. I think that was more <laughs> – I, I, I know I know that sounds bizarre, Whoa. but it, it's be, like it's he, he, he wants, wants to win. win. Yeah, he wants to win. He wants his team to win more. It was basically he was catching that ball a lot of times because there was nobody else who was going to catch it for Marcus Mariota. Yeah, yeah. that's just what it came yeah. down to. He, he if, had a couple if, free if, if catches you ask last Tom year. Kowski whether or not he wants to catch the ball or choose to win, he's going to say, "What kind of stupid question is <laughs> when that?" When I catch it's the ball, both. I win. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I hear no, you. Though. I hear you. I hear you. They they need to be more Tennessee well rounded team. Tennessee needs yeah, a, a, a wide receiver one, and not in the fantasy football terms. They need a wide receiver one in the NFL terms. NFL terms. You're yeah. absolutely right. And they don't have that. They've got Doriel Green Beckham, maybe. Yeah. No, this, and is, this, this goes back to the, the yeah. fear that we all get, and I think we've talked about other topics that we could potentially go with shows on this, and that is that certain teams just do not strike you as somebody I even want to touch. Yeah. And Tennessee is one of those teams. It's one of those teams. But in the in the sixth round, taking a, a tight end like Walker, he's probably going to get t- he's, he's going to get looked at. An up and comer like. Um, um, Marcus Mariota, it's a good pick. I think if you're going to take a tight end, it that might position, be a little early though. Well, well and I'll admit this was once again we're doing a balance, balance thing. Balance approach. Yeah, I was already in sixth round. I had rounded out my three wide receivers. You're not going to be upset with that. So I want to. You're not going to be upset. Before we with go that. on to we'll AJ's produce. team, the last one I'm going to mention is my seventh pick, Chris Ivory, which I had uh, the Jacksonville <laughs> fellow last year, uh, the, the rookie who could not get in the end zone to save his fucking life. And there's a reason that Jacksonville went out and got Chris Ivory. And and I want those touchdowns. You know, I got. I, 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 I okay, I, I, yeah, I once, I once was driving down the road and <laughs> I saw a bus pulled over and it had a Jaguar sign over it and had a flat tire. So how many of them did it take to change that tire, John? Ten. Well, the answer is one, unless it's a blowout, and then it's the whole offense that shows up. Yeah. And I think in this particular case, Chris Ivory potential for catching the passes out of the backfield. And making that team more valuable when coming from behind, just like the other two, the wide receivers that are coming out of there. I mean, you got to like what's coming out of Jacksonville. Frank, you've talked about it before. Yeah, no, I mean, I think Jack- Jacksonville is going to be more well, more well-rounded team. Thus, I think a pick like Chris Ivory on that team is actually one of the few spots where I think you might see improvement. May not because be a lot of blowouts. There are a lot. Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of running backs on that team. But at the same time, if they are playing ahead, then that means they're going to be running the ball more than they're throwing exactly. the ball. Exactly. So. It could, it could bode well. Yeah, so. John, I'll say your team is balanced, but I'd say it's balanced towards taking players too early. <laughs> That's what I, said. I think Chris Ivory, you could probably snag him way later than seventh, Delaney Walker way later than the sixth, and Michael Floyd way later than the fifth. And I think why is that? And it's because when you force yourself, like I was doing in this draft, to remain balanced, you're forcing yourself not to pick the best available player. Well, that was the point of the balance stretch. No, 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 no. That was my, my point being, you need to, when you're in your actual draft in a couple months, remember not to walk into your draft saying, oh, I need to stay balanced. No, you need to pick the best available player. That's my opinion. I'm just putting out well, there. Well, you know, you, you don't you, necessarily. You the role, and I think you took some solid picks. I particularly like Lamar Miller, Cam Newton, where you took him. And Kelvin Benjamin hopefully has a ton of upside this year. Yeah, I'm giving you a hard time, John, but I, I, I think your team has some, some serious potential. But uh, let's move on to AJ's team. AJ, what was your strategy? So I was the running back heavy guy. Kind of the classic strategy when it comes yeah, to Yeah, classic football. strategy. Absolutely. Um, well, it's been repeated by winners after winners. 
Um, I, I didn't stick strictly to running backs. I, I did balance it out where I felt like I needed to. But I definitely took the first uh, two guys as running backs and followed it up near the end with a couple extras. And um, a couple picks that I really like and a couple I don't. Um, I will say one thing about this year. If you're not taking a wide receiver in the first three rounds, uh, particularly the first two rounds, you might be missing out on some real talent um, and dependability. So I, I, I exchanged that for a little bit um, going with the running backs, particularly with the first one. Uh, I would have probably have taken Julio here, which Frank got at seven. I got Gurley at six. I like Gurley, though. I really, really like Gurley. Well, I'm going to say a couple. Really you know, I, I, I got numbers. I got numbers for days. <laughs> Gurley's got some numbers I like a lot. And, and I mean, the big running back guys that I took, I, I got numbers for. And the first number that stands out to me with Todd Gurley is uh, 4.8. I mean, the dude got a, got it done after contact. And 4.8 yards after contact? 4.8 out contact, wow. after contact. He then picked it up with 10 TDs. Mm-hmm. In 13 games, no, at 11, like, no, he, only, he, he was mm-hmm. injured. He had injuries last year. No, I was going to say it's less than 13, 13 yeah, games. Than, I thought it was I think he nine, nine or up, ten he games. He might have suited up and played a few hand handoffs. I think he there. started nine. But I think 11, I could be wrong. Six yards, ten TDs, and four point eight. And and the, and what I like about this is you're going to see production go up. They're moving to LA. They need a franchise name. They need somebody to represent that team in LA. And Todd Gurley's gorgeous locks of long, dreadlocked, dirty hair because he doesn't bathe to get dreadlocks, probably going to be the guy. He is a, he's Adrian Peters, Peterson's replacement in the NFL. I agree with you. I mean, like, I've said this before, and I won't harp on it too much more just because I've said it so many times. I think that Todd Gurley is the premier talent as far as young running backs are concerned. He can cast, catch passes. He can run up and down the field. He can pass block. He can do it all just like AP did. He has a similar body type um, and a similar work ethic. Yeah, but he's a got solid speed frame of and mind. The cutting that he has is unreal. And besides these uh, numbers you're talking about, I want to give you three letters to remember. U G A. Puppies, baby. Yeah, we're out, dogs of here. out of Georgia here. We're absolutely repping our dogs. Um, my next pick, uh, I, I went with another next best running back at number two, um, 14th overall pick, Doug Martin. Um, the muscle hamster, things to be said. Um, the number that I want to repeat to you here, and, and I've, I had I had him on my team last year, and in the first four games, he was abysmal. I mean, absolutely abysmal. But Andy, let me just ask you, how was he in the last Well, after you dropped him, <laughs> <laughs> well, after you dropped him, and somehow, let, let me tell you what was so just glorious about what happened. AJ dropped the muscle hamster, and I was like, oh, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bid on him because I'm pretty sure someone else is gonna bid way higher than me. So I'll just put in a waiver pick for him. Nobody bid on the muscle hamster. Nobody believed in him. Nobody believed in him. I had this like illogical belief from well, his rookie well, season. John and Andy, let me tell you what you can believe in from last year. One thousand four hundred two rushing yards, four point nine yards per okay. carry. Four point nine. The one number I don't like so much is this, this is just rushing yards, six TDs. So he's gonna, we're gonna have to. But, but, but here's, this is a team that runs the football. Right. Here's the thing, though. It's like, do you attribute Muscle Hamster's rebirth to Jameis Winston picking up and therefore thinking he'll do oh, better next year? Because, to, no, not because of his focus on next year, but that absolutely is finding a swagger. It helped the team find a swagger. I think Jameis Winston will be. Better this year than he was last year. Definitely. I mean, could you imagine being on the defensive team, uh, you know, play, playing against these guys, and you're like, okay, I've now I've got the, the guard against the hamster, plus this new motherfucker who can also run the ball, and he also took a few away from Doug Martin, the quarterback. I don't think and, James Winston's correct- much of a runner, but um, but well, that being said, no, that's not fair. I mean, he, well, no, but the thing, he's a better passer than Adam Freeman or whatever the fuck that guy was. Freeman, I can't oh, remember now. Yeah, Josh Freeman. Josh Freeman. Josh yeah. Freeman, the guy who had the had the abortion of a game with Minnesota. Oh <laughs> my god! I never <laughs> was like, yeah, but you know what I like about this? There's another number I didn't mention, and that's the fact that correct me if I'm wrong, but he played every game last year. Uh, muscle hamster. The dude's, I think the he, dude's been proving. Some yeah, no, he he had some serious durability. He got hurt the year before, and. Um, that was probably why you, uh, you were able to pick him, I think, in the eighth round of the draft yeah. last year. Yeah, but, I mean, like, keeper this year, that's for sure. Yeah, would have been great. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm just going to move on. I mean, I'm going to say one thing about my first two picks that I don't like going with this running back strategy in the sixth overall spot. 
is that uh, my first team that I'm, I mean, Todd Gurley plays for the Rams and Doug Martin plays for the Bucks. Like, I, I, I simply, personally, will never pick players in the first two or three rounds like that. I mean, I already told you, Frank, you got Julio and AJ and TY and Cobb in the first Well, what you picks. did, and we did this on purpose, just for the audience that's listening, we did this on purpose. We handcuffed ourselves to give you an idea of what a strategy would look like. And again, I think we all take kind of a similar strategy as you pick the best player. You don't go for like a specific strategy. That being said, when you when you have certain strategies that look really good, like Frank's wide receiver heavy, then you go with that. But but continue, AJ, because you're right. You did balance it out a little bit. I think yeah, this next pick I came in with something, again, not another quality team that I would typically want to be a part of for an entire season. But this next pick is just too juicy not to, to, to pass him up. And I took Coop, Amari Cooper over T.Y. Hilton. And I think with David Carr coming in after the last uh, few games of last season where he was so solid, and between him and Crabtree, they just make an amazing duo coming out of Oakland. I mean, who doesn't want Amari Cooper on their team? Oh, I love Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper's sexy in, in many ways. I mean, the dude's got the deep threat capability. He's strong. He's tall. He's athletic. What, what about him do you, can anybody personally – I don't think anybody can say anything they don't like about him. I did not specifically go out – Looking to pick up wide receivers here, I just felt that in this particular position with the way that our league is set up where you have two starting running backs and then a flex, um, I personally needed to pick up with this strategy a wide receiver. You cannot, cannot, cannot handcuff yourself to picking up more than three players in the first round. Right, One mean, of them has got to be a wide receiver. Right, and I think yeah. at the end of the day what you were looking at was picking up another Doug Martin-esque running back Maybe not a terrible way to to ensure that you got a good ru- running back core, but now you're really hurting with wide receivers if you, you don't go because so many wide receivers are going early. Yeah, you got to have one, and so I think in the first three rounds, regardless of what strategy is or whether you go with a tight end, kind of have to or a, a wide or a quarterback or whatever. I think you've got to pick up a wide receiver in the first three. So my next pick, um, Lashawn McCoy. I think in the fourth round, he's a steal. Oh yeah. I'm going to throw out some more LaShawn McCoy numbers here. Um, it wasn't so much what he did with his feet last year, um, but what he did holistically, which was um, 895 on the ground and 292 receiving. Um, the dude uh, had a little bit of a down year, but I especially expect um, the Bills to have a better season. Tyrod Taylor will be improved. Sammy Watkins should give them some flexibility with a deep threat and, a, and some very sure hands. And I think that LaShawn McCoy is your boy. I mean, I think he's going to get the rock and he's going to get it often. Yeah, I guess the concern I had with LaShawn McCoy last uh, last year, and there's the injury concern for sure um, with LaShawn McCoy, but his upside and his talent, really his talent is what shines out to me more than anything else, is that when you look at LaShawn McCoy, his ability to upcut players, his shiftiness, his ability to catch passes out of the backfield, those things – Add up and like really make. Him oh a sexy no! Any player. given, even any given Sunday, he is potentially the best athlete on the field. And in the fourth round, I think he makes a great flex. And I mean, the upside's there. The upside's there to justify it. Well, maybe, he might, maybe he does break his, uh, you know, break <coughs> his ankle, but maybe he ends up having a shady 2013, 2014 sure. year type thing. Uh, my next pick, um, I couldn't pass him up in the fifth. This was too juicy, even with my current plan and the fact that I need wide receivers. I saw Andrew Luck in the fifth round, and I, I don't personally, I think when I draft in on Labor Day weekend in two months, I don't think I'll take a quarterback this early. I'm probably going to go with someone more like Matthew Stafford or, um, or Tyra Taylor. Tyra, yeah, yeah and there's so many guys that you can pick up in the tenth round that are amazing quality quarterbacks that could have amazing years. But if you got Andrew Luck in the fifth, I think you got to take him. I think he's up for a uh, better year than last year. Last year was kind of a fluke. So... There's no way Andrew Luck will be available in the fifth round of yeah. any intelligent fantasy football league. <laughs> I, I just, mean, yeah, I mean, I even halfway. About this. We've talked I about mean, this, especially. Well, not only that, like there, are, there are these expert leagues where they like have this like uh, scarlet ba- scarlet letter where if you draft a quarterback too early, you're ostracized and laughed at because like, mm-hmm. oh, if you're an expert, you don't believe in taking the quarterback early. Mm-hmm. But in almost every other league, people take quarterbacks early. And I don't think it's a bad idea necessarily when it's Andrew Luck in the third or fourth round. If Andrew Luck's available for me in the third round, I'll be taking him. <laughs> yeah. You can quote me on that. Yeah. And I, Well, I'm in the seventh spot in our league, so, I mean, it makes sense for me. So 27? Absolutely. I'll take him. Yeah. I'll fucking take him. 
Yeah, but in this particular case, at 40, 44... It's absurd. It's Thank absurd. You. It's mean, because I, it's I, a I mock draft. Happen. People aren't taking him because well, they're focused playing, on their team, and we, so they're just ignoring Andrew Luck. We didn't give you enough backstory. F- f- six of the other individuals that we did this against are completely random strangers. Probably one of you listening, you stupid assholes. But <laughs> I will tell you right now that um, if you can get Luck in anywhere below the fifth round, you are getting a steal. In the sixth round, I thought I needed another wide receiver. There's not much to say here other than Jeremy Macklin is potentially in the sixth round. You're getting a number one wide receiver. Out of, out of Kansas City, they may not be a run uh, pass-heavy team, but uh, Macklin's a proven workhorse. He's still got plenty of uh, a speed in his, in his jets, and I think um, you're getting a potential number one guy. Number seven, um, this is an interesting pick, and I'll let y'all give me your take, but I took DeMarco Murray. Um, I had him last year, and I got a little bit burnt. I think the Philadelphia Eagles did too. Um, but here I am walking in in the seventh round to a number one running back out of, out of Tennessee, and you're getting a number one guy. And if I get DeMarco Murray in the seventh round, I, I, I will be very happy with that. This is my backup running back. DeMarco Murray is my backup. Nothing upset about that. My next guy, and I've already given John shit for this, but I took John Brown in the eighth. I mean, that's a steal. I think that's a steal. Yeah. I mean, John Brown has so much upside. I think there's a potential for him to become the guy that Carson Palmer uh, just peppers throughout the year. And I think that if you can get John Brown in the sixth, I might take him in the sixth. I mean, I already talked about Sean McCoy possibly being the best athlete on the field. John Brown is potentially the best athlete on a field any given day. The guy is a man. For Arizona. Yeah. For Arizona, I mean, yeah, you, when you're when you're fucking playing guys like Julio Jones, maybe he's not. But given what Arizona's done, the guy's young, he's talented, he's got hands, and he's got a quarterback who can get him the ball in the eighth round. Any one of those three wide receivers, so Cheryl Brown or um, Michael Floyd. Uh, Michael Floyd, I'd be very happy with. Yeah, so, and they're all going about the same area. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. This is not the team I would walk away with with the biggest grin. But given this strategy, I don't think you can go wrong with that many running backs. I mean, I got huge blockbuster names on my list with Gurley, Martin, McCoy, and Murray. And I think anybody that has those four names would be a fucking happy person. And again, you can play some of those in your flex. One of them is guaranteed to get hurt, probably two of them. <laughs> yep. So that's why you draft them early. Yep. I went, so thank you, AJ, for your running back heavy strategy. I am the wild card team. <coughs> So that is my team. So I did like exactly what every fantasy expert will tell you not to do. I drafted quarterbacks early. I drafted tight ends early. I said <laughs> fuck wide receivers and running backs. So I'm going to give you guys my wild card team, and no wild card team starts without the best wild card of them all. Gronk, 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 Gronk. Gronk. He fucks supermodels. Gronk spikes the ball to Mongolia. He does not spend a dime of his salary. And last year, by the way, he caught for 1,170 yards for 11 touchdowns. That's a tight, that, that is a wide receiver. That's not a tight end. Yeah, I mean, that's... He's not a tight end. He's he a wide is, receiver. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, basically, he is... There, there are tiers of wide receivers, and the first tier of wide receiver is named Gronk. <laughs> and that is why you take him in the first. Or, God, if you can get him in the early second, take him. I got him with the 18th pick last year in one of my leagues, and I almost won the league. The only reason I didn't is because God hates me. But, do, you, do you ever wonder what fantasy football will, will be like without Gronk? Like, will there ever be a tight end that replaces him? No, I mean, Jimmy Graham for a while was yeah. kind of a similar guy. But, he was, but not no, anymore. But, I mean, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just, that just doesn't happen. Like, you don't take tight ends in the first round. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember there was one year Jeff took Gronk with the fifth pick and was able to keep him, and the rest of the league were shoving razor-studded dildos up their asses in regret mm-hmm. for not having taken Gronk before the fourth round because Gronk, again, was a number one pick. Or no, a first well, pick. he was hurt. He missed his first like, right. few games. Understood, but at the same time, once he came back, he was Gronk again. Yeah. Anyway, number two, so even though it's a wild card, like you, you kind of have to, like, you know, be somewhat reasonable with your team. I took Jordy Nelson, the great white hope, uh, the only wide receiver, white wide receiver that really is in the elite of the elite. 
Maybe you can kind of consider Julian Edelman, but not really in the same level as Jordy Nelson. What in 2014, color, what color is he again? I believe he is a white man. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the whites. One of the whites. <laughs> he, he is. A, what I noticed about my picks was the first three guys were white guys. Whatever. Wild card! <laughs> Wild card! <laughs> what? Anyway, Jordy Nelson in 2014, the year he wasn't hurt, uh, had 1,620 yards for 11 touchdowns. The guy is just a beast. Uh, he has the best quarterback thrown to him. Why not take him with the 15th pick, which is what I, where I was picking? I mean, if he picks up from where he left off – a year ago, this is something you feel very good about. The question is always, do you want to spend a second round pick on a guy that you're just not sure about? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, no, but Jordy Nelson, I'm pretty sure about. Because, like, listen, I know that, like, people break their ankles and tear their MCLs and all that stuff. That happens all the time. Uh, I don't, name me one great player who hasn't had a, a big injury, and I'll show you a fucking you know, a diamond that is the size of Jeffrey's head. I mean, they, it always happens. It always happens. So, like, what I'm saying basically is that you don't look at injuries from the year before and think that that, that makes a player undraftable. You just don't. And in my Necessarily. mind... Necessarily. It depends on the injury. There's always caveats to that. Well, let's talk but about you're right. Like a lot Jamal of people Charles, are You know, Jamal I'm, Charles. He I'm has, not going to draft Le'Veon Bell. I don't care how good he is. I had him last year. He tore his ACL. And I didn't have him. Well, okay, that's season. your problem, Major, because like I remember the year you weren't going to draft Aaron Rodgers, so I drafted Aaron Rodgers. Oh, the year that I drafted him, he freaking tore his ACL. And you didn't take him. You didn't take him the pick before I took him, so I took him, and he ended up scoring forty eight hundred yards, thirty eight touchdowns, uh, rushed for two hundred fifty. And you know they're on the ground. Yeah, so I'm just know, saying, like you, listen, you, listen, you listen, do what listen. you do. Don't draft Le'Veon Bell. Trust me, I don't want take, you to. Take You're drafting nipple. before me again. So don't draft Le'Veon Bell. I'll gladly pick up that fucking unicorn and fuck him all the way to a fantasy championship. All right, you take that that you take that buffalo nickel and you flip it on the <laughs> other side and you got a tail. So go <laughs> ahead, draft him, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's two steps slow. Maybe Jordy Nelson gets That's all passed possible, by Randall right? Cobb. It's fantasy football. This all is I'm going to say is I wouldn't take Levy on Bell in the eighth round. Right. <laughs> but if, if shits and puts could be Christmas and cookie, whatever no, that no, no. thing is. If, like, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> fuck it, guys. Yeah, anything can happen. You're right. Anything can move happen. on. Let's let anyway, move on. The wild card still going here. Number three. Uh, John kind of stole my thunder because I thought drafting a quarterback in the third round was wild card, but John was like, no, that's balanced. <laughs> I was like, wild card, guys! I don't even think I need to justify picking Aaron Rodgers in the third round because he's such a good player and you hope that he has a breakout year, but that would be awesome to me to get him in the late third like I did. With uh, the 27th pick, or 26th pick. With, with that decision. Definitely. Yeah. With the fourth round, I went with Matt Forte. This oh, is the for first God. running back I took off the board. He played only 13 games last year, but with those 13 games, he had 1,300 yards from scrimmage with seven touchdowns. So that's solid production. I'd expect him to match that sort of production per game. Granted, he might get hurt. I mean, he's an older running back, but again, what type of running back won't get hurt? Uh, the fifth round with the 46th pick, I chose Ryan Matthews. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, they look at you kind of weird when you pick Ryan Matthews this early. Just because he's been Fumble Rooski, Mr. Fumble Rooski, Mr. Undependable. Last year he was playing second fiddle, playing second fiddle to DeMarco Murray. Well, DeMarco Murray's gone. The only other running back show in town is the ageless wonder, Malisandre Darren Sproles. And uh, <laughs> uh, I just don't think Darren Sproles will continue to be the, the sprightly leprechaun that he is. Um, Ryan Matthews is the running back core in Philadelphia. And because of that, I'm willing to take the fifth pick with him. I have one question about Ryan Matthews and the NFL gentlemen in general. Do you think they utilize Tinder? I mean, I think that they do. They, they, only, they probably have their butler swipe for them, only have the hottest girls that swipe right, and then they immediately get fucked all the time. Excellent. Yeah. And so, sorry, John, but you fucking that somewhat fugly 20-year-old redhead, ODB doesn't have any problem. I do not think they use Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think they use, they use, I go to a club and have pussy crawling all over. You know, I, yeah, I, I, I know we're, I, I know we're going off track here. Dabble. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a picture last year that was circulating in the interwebs, I believe, of 
Uh, a one Julian Edelman yeah, Julian. and a one that was a Snapchat ODB. Oh, it was a Snapchat. Ah, Snapchat. No, but the Tinder Still was got ODB. all over the internet. The Tinder, oh, what else? This girl. Yeah. I mean, I, you probably seen this if you're These a man like us. This, yeah, this whore. She uh, <laughs> said, "said just fucked ODB. Get on my level, bitches." Yeah. At, with a ah. picture of her uh, smacking ODB with a big old kiss on the cheek, and guaranteed she kissed more than his cheek. But anyway. Moving on to my number six, Larry Fitz, another another one of those Arizona Cardinals. Uh, John Brown was available. I passed up on John Brown. AJ got him in the eighth. Uh, John took Michael Floyd in the fifth. I, I think you start taking those Arizona wide receivers in the late sixth. That's where I think they go. Late sixth, early seventh, that's where you take them. I think the consensus from the block is that, Jenny, you are correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you, AJ. Number seven, uh, Jeremy <clears throat> Langford. Uh, running back extraordinaire from uh, from Chicago, um, I really when he passed the eye test last year to me, I get I get that there are some question marks about him, that there are some question marks about the running game in general in Chicago with Matt Forte leaving. Not sure they're how they're going to utilize that that run game, but I really like his upside. Um, number eight, going with the wild card again, and just because I have a wild card team, I pick the best defense that's out there, uh, Denver. Uh, Denver. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If you watched them in the playoffs, you just realized how next level they were. You know, I think I think next level is uh, is not enough. I think supernatural is probably more like what you're wanting to say. And if there's one thing that Denver defense was able to do last year. It was what Billy Graham does every Sunday, and that is he gets seventy thousand people to stand up in this in those stands. And the other team is saying, "Jesus Christ, I'm playing Denver." Yeah. He gets 70,000 people to say, Jesus Christ. I mean, dude, they were an awesome team. And so for my ninth pick, again, like if you're going to go with the wild card strategy, pick pick an early defense. There's some value to be had there because you don't have to worry about mixing and matching all this Listen, bullshit. you're fool to take a defense in the eighth. You know what's but, the thing about defenses, too? But, they don't get injured. But they don't. <laughs> <laughs> you're never going to have an listen, injured defense. Listen, listen, you're fool to take him in the eighth. Andy did it because it's, it's the strategy, the balance strategy. I'm the wild card. The wild bitches. card. Ba- I don't even can know. I, can balance I, your wild card at this point. But I will say, Denver's defense is awesome, but don't take them in the eighth. Well, all right, the rebuttal to that, and Andy Andy did make the point this out to me a couple months back, is that go back and look at all your fucking mock, your, your actual drafts you've done throughout your life, like real drafts. Your eighth round is normally some piece of shit that you ended up dropping in week three. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, shit. there is this. There shit. is that. You, at least shit. you know there's some some solid shit there. Or it was Danny but you, Woodhead. Yeah. <laughs> or it was Danny Woodhead, yeah, and I you know, missed I mean, out. But, I, I mean, there is some truth to it. You And I really, I thought that, that was a good point you made, you know, before. So. Yeah, and, and, like, here's the thing with it. It's like, it, you don't have to take a defense in the eighth. You don't have to pick a defense in the eighth. You could pick a defense in the ninth or tenth, and still, who would you pick in the ninth or tenth that would be as valuable as that great defense that you ended up getting? Again, a lot of times the problem is there's too many people that take the defenses too early. So you end up getting Danny Woodhead because some dude took Denver in the in the seventh. So understandable. you got to play with it. Again, the wild card is not a strategy. I wouldn't say pick a tight end in the first because no one else does it, or pick a quarterback in the third because no one else does it. Pick a, you know, you, you have to really, at the end of the day, you have to look on the board, who's the best player available. Sometimes going with a wild card strategy works because you get Gronk in the second and Aaron Rodgers in the fourth and Denver in the ninth. But I don't know why I'm getting bukkake right now. Right now, Jeffrey's bukkake me. He just walked in from fishing, so fuck you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Anyway, you didn't catch anything today. Yeah. My my last pick that I'm going to go over is Deshaun Jack. I needed a late I needed a late wide receiver because I only had two at this point, Larry Fitz and Jordy Nelson. So I needed a late bloomer, and that late bloomer for me was Deshaun Jack. I don't think he can feel upset about that in the eighth. Not in the ninth, ninth. in the least bit. Not, not in the ninth. ninth. Excuse me. I think Deshaun Jackson is uh, up there in one of the top five deep threats in the NFL. The man's got wheels. He can burn anybody. The question is, will he catch the football? And um, last year, he had a pretty darn good season. He's managed to put together a string of great seasons after he uh, from Philadelphia and today, and I think that's a good pick, Andy. Thank you, AJ. And that wraps up our Pickle Barrel podcast for this year, uh, or for this for this episode. Thank you for joining us. We're going to send you off with, do you like pickle pudding? 
one of the great songs from one of these oh, five. I do. Five <laughs> Yes, I do. Yes, I do.